welcome to this first uh, science symposium of the National Decommissioning Research Initiative. Uh, my name is Andrew Taylor. I'm the program director for the NDRI and um, would just like to welcome you today to this session. As I said, it's the first one we've run. We're very excited. We have a jam packed agenda comprised of a keynote speaker and two panel sessions involving the key NDRI researchers. So we're very excited uh, to be running this event and we're very excited that you're here with us today. I will just take us through some uh, a few introductory slides just to familiarize you with the NDRI and, and what it is, and also just talk through the format for today. So uh, just to start, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on uh, lands of the traditional owners. Uh, I'd also like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, in Perth, where we are, that is the Wujak, uh, Wujak Noongar people. I'd also like to note that in terms of the speakers today, they are experts in the field. They were selected through an extensive um, process of assessment. Um, the views they put forward today do not represent those of NERA or the National Decommissioning Research Initiative, and they shouldn't be considered indicative of the outcomes of the projects we have underway. Those projects, as we will talk about a little bit later, will be wrapping up over the next 12 months at various points. And uh, it is at that point, once those uh, th that research has been through peer review, that you should treat their views as final. And just a matter of housekeeping. So I think everyone by now is very familiar with the functions of Zoom or any other video conferencing platform. Um, just to note though, that the, the speakers, so people like Milton Love and people within the panel sessions today are on a separate Zoom call. They cannot see the Zoom uh, chat that you uh, may be asking questions or making comments in, but those comments will be transcribed across to the room that the speakers are in. So we will be able to see what you're saying, but we can't see it instantly. If you do um, have a question, please enter that into the chat. And if you do see a question which you are interested in, please upvote it uh, and we'll endeavor to address those questions first. So if we have a look across uh, the session today, which is running from nine o'clock through to about 1 p.m. Perth time. So as I said, I, I am your host for today. Um, I'll shortly hand over to Professor Peter McCready as the Chair of the Independent Scientific Advisory Board of the NDRI. Um, we will have Dr. Milton Love from the Uni University of California as a keynote speaker today. And we have two panel sessions which are comprised of the NDRI uh, lead researchers. So the first panel will be talking about the impact of structures uh, on the ecosystem, what are the risks and benefits of removal, and the second panel facilitated by Dr. Tom Creswell from ANSTO will be talking about, well, what happens if structures are left in the ocean? Both of those panel sessions go to the research that we have commissioned un under the NDRI um, and will involve a quick five minute introduction from each research lead followed by uh, a panel conversation. We also, I will note as well, we also have a couple of surveys we're hoping to run today. The first one we will run before we get into um, the, the full proceedings for the day, because we are looking to capture views on what people think about this issue of um, particularly oil and gas structures in the marine environment, whether, whether that is a good or a bad thing and what, what the risks and, and potential benefits are. When we talk about uh, decommissioning in Australia, specifically in the context of oil and gas, we are talking about a $52 billion liability um, nationally around the country with the key jurisdictions being that off the Northwest of Western Australia and then off the Southeast of Victoria. 57 platforms, about 8,000 kilometers of pipeline and about a thousand wells to be plugged and abandoned. Um, this data is available on NERA's website through a report we commissioned last year um, with consultancy at Vision. Now, just quickly in terms of the journey to today and the National Decommissioning and the establishment of the National Decommissioning Research Initiative, 
Uh, I did talk about this last week at the APA conference in a bit of detail, but worth recap those who were able. In 2017 and prior, we, the industry in Australia, largely commissioned discrete projects on a case-by-case -case basis. So research was undertaken internally, it wasn't often shared, uh, and there was not a lot of visibility around uh, what companies were looking at with regards to the impact of their structures uh, on the ocean. In 2018, we had uh, two reports, one by the Western Australian Marine Science Institute, looking at stakeholder perspectives of decommissioning, largely looking at views of commercial and recreational fishers. Uh, and then secondly, we had a report commissioned through APIA, which was a scientific literature review, looking at the environmental impacts of various decommissioning options. Um, those two reports were really the first uh, signs of collaborative research with regards to decommissioning in Australia. So, and when I say collaborative, I mean industry-wide. Shortly after that, we had a bid to establish a cooperative decommissioning offshore infrastructure that was led by the University of Western Australia. That, that bid was unfortunately not successful, but it did catalyze a, a shift within industry and the research community about the need to come together to look at decommissioning research collaboratively. From that proposal, the oil and gas companies recommitted their funds to the establishment of an industry-led program. A number of those companies were involved in the North Sea in the Insight program and encouraged that we looked at uh, bringing that program to Australia. So in 2018, um, APIA approached NERA, National Energy Resources Australia, where I work, and requested NERA as an independent arms leg facilitator of, of industry solutions to uh, look at establishing a collaborative research program based on INSIGHT. We then borrowed many of the different functions of INSIGHT, such as uh, around governance and, the, and an executive committee and and an independent scientific advisor and established the National Decommissioning Research Initiative formally in 2019 after about 18 months of contract negotiation. So the NDRI was, as I mentioned, established arm's length to industry. Um, it is, is, has been established to facilitate scientifically robust independent research on the effects of oil and gas infrastructure in the Australian offshore marine environment. The initial phase of work, which we are talking about today, commissioned in 2019 through to 2022, really seeks to establish a baseline understanding of what decommissioning in Australia looks like. Um, it is independent and importantly, it is agnostic. The view of NDRI is that the science will speak for itself as to whether or not uh, the impact of structures in the marine environment uh, is positive, negative, or both. It's managed by NERA as the independent facilitator. It is funded by eight uh, industry companies uh, and that first phase of funding is around about $3.4 million. And this is what it looks like uh, in terms of how it functions. So we have an executive committee of industry uh, participants who provide oversight of strategic direction um, and ensure that the program is delivering in line with industry needs. We have the Independent Scientific Advisory Board comprised of four representatives who we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and we also have the ability to appoint independent technical advisors and we have one of those appointed at the moment. Um, all of those various boxes connect through NERA, as I said, as an arm's length independent facilitator and we deal directly with the various NDRI projects. Okay, so that brings us to the uh, end of that quick introduction. As I mentioned, we are very keen to understand uh, the views of attendees on what they think about decommissioning. NDRI has commissioned a survey, which is currently available on iPads in Adelaide at the Museum of Discovery at an exhibition looking at the impact of structures on the marine environment. To support that data collection, and this survey was designed by Cardiff University, so again, it's independent of NDRI. Um, we would be very keen, if you could, take a few minutes to go to menti.com and enter that code that's on the screen in front of you, 74241600. 
We are going to allow probably about seven minutes for you to complete that survey if you could, and that will help us gather an additional data set around what people think about decommissioning. Um, so with that in mind, I'm just going to turn my video off for a few minutes and then I'll reappear uh, once, that, once we have allowed a bit of time for people to go and have a look at that survey. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a word cloud in front of us um, with a huge variety of, of words and at, at fairly consistent sizes. Offshore large energy environment fish, or fairly strongly there. We will do analysis of, of the data we've captured and we will um, see how we can share that around. I can see we've had 59 responses, so that's uh, excellent. Let's just go to the next. Fairly strong reasons as well, uh, in terms of what people think about oil and gas platforms and how much they agree with the statements roughly down the middle in terms of the last four and then the first two in terms of uh, providing energy, very, very strongly supportive and impressed by design and engineering, again, very strongly supportive. Um, a bit more divergence of views in terms of removing platforms. I see there's still some results coming through. Uh, the survey will still be open, so you can still uh, respond to this after we continue. And then in terms of pipelines, looks fairly similar, fairly similar to the results to platforms as well in terms of what people think about decommissioning. So I strongly agree that removing pipelines would damage marine life. Uh, that's 3.4 and making pipelines safe to leave in water would be ideal. Um, not surprisingly, con you know, the converse to that is pipelines should be removed completely. So more disagreement with that as well. Okay, and demographically, um, looks like 40 to 54 is the general general age. Okay, thank you very much uh, for those who managed to send a response into that survey. Again, really appreciate you taking the time to do that and, and giving us a, a bit more data to work with in terms of that survey. We are running at the Museum of Discovery. We will be running a second Menti at the very end of the event today, just to see if views change at all based on some of the conversation. Okay, so I am just going to stop sharing that screen and I am going to come back to my slides. Okay, so moving on um, and stepping towards, I think one of, the, um, one of the key things people are here to see of, um, Dr. Milton Love. So I'm just going to uh, firstly introduce the chair of the Independent Scientific Advisory Board, Professor Peter McCready, who's been with NDRI since the very beginning. Uh, Pete was brought on board. He was the first ISAB appointment um, back in 2018 and has been absolutely pivotal to the development of NDRI, um, as has Professor Ian Southers. Um, from the University of New South Wales. So Pete is the chair of the NDRI, NDRI ISAB. He's also uh, the head of the Blue Carbon Lab at Deakin University. We also, as I mentioned, have Ian Southers from the University of New South Wales, Dr. Sally Rouse from Marine Science Scotland, Rick Tinker from Arpanza. I did have a typo on an earlier slide saying Rick was from Anstow, but he's from Arpanza. And uh, our one and only independent technical advisor, Richard Hurd. Okay, so with that in mind, I am now going to hand over to Peter McCready. Andrew, before you go off screen, I just want to acknowledge and thank you for the tremendous job you've done as NDRI program director. I know it hasn't been an easy journey. We had 18 months of contract negotiation with eight industry partners and navigating through multitudes of potential and perceived conflict of interest and uh, bridging the industry academic divide plus herding lots of cats. So you've left us in great shape. Uh, I'm certainly going to miss you. And yeah, on behalf of the ISAB, so Ian, Sally, Rick, Rick and Richard, and also the NDRI sponsors, thank you very much. And we wish you all the best in your new role. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> uh, so back to the program, what did we do with the $2.3 million for research? Well, uh, we put these funds towards addressing two questions. The first was, how does life in the marine environment respond to the presence and removal of these structures? So really a question about the biology and the ecology. 
And then the second was to look at what happens to these assets over time. So I guess you call that the physical and chemical side of things. And let's delve a bit more into that because it sets the scene for the two panels today. So AIM-1 had three parts to it. We looked at the habitat value, the connectivity and invasive species. So are these structures providing important habitat value? Uh, the question was addressed by analyzing remotely operated vehicle footage or ROV footage. And um, after this slide, you'll see what some of that looks like. And then how do structures affect ecological connectivity in the oceans, which is mainly about the movement of organisms. And then invasive species, are invasive species on these structures? And what happens to the potential spread of invasives if we remove structures versus leaving them in place? Then we've got AIM-2, which it looks at what rate do metals and non-metals, such as microplastics, break down? And so if we left structures in the oceans, would they stick around for decades, centuries, or millennia, and what would be their fate? And then with naturally occurring radioactive materials or mercury, we asked some similar questions. What is the release rate of these contaminants and what impact does this have on the marine environment? And how do the risks compare uh, leaving in the oceans versus removing these structures? Uh, so that's just a really quick overview. You'll hear more about that from the panels later this afternoon. And Joe, if you could just cue the video, please. And as Andrew mentioned, there's some research that um, doesn't appear in that slide, uh, which is about public perceptions to the issue, so social science. And those of you who took part in that Mentimeter survey just then, you're a part of that research, so thank you. And this survey has been running for several months now at the Mod Gallery in Adelaide, where they have an exhibit showcasing the issue called It's Complicated. So if you're in Adelaide, please check it out. Um, Joe, if you're happy to press play on the ROV highlights video, that'd be great. Um, and I guess what we expect is that the average person on the street probably isn't aware of this issue. It's sort of out of sight, out of mind. So this is different uh, to many other parts of the world. Uh, in my time in the UK, it seemed like public perceptions of the issue uh, were, were very um, perhaps negative. Uh, structures should be removed. Um, but I've also stood on the shores of Alabama with locals who look out fondly on the horizon in awe and amazement of these structures. They're a thing of beauty. Um, there are more than 4,000 jackets in the Gulf of Mexico, 37,000 kilometers of pipeline. It's about the circumference of the earth. It's the largest artificial reef complex in the world. Um, now, okay, so the video is playing, that's good. I can't see it on my screen. Um, so I'm not sure where we're up to. Um, if you are able to cue it on my screen so I can see where we're at, that would be great. Um, so people I think are becoming more aware of our impact on the planet. And last month's Chinese rocket debris crashing into the Indian Ocean got us thinking about space junk. Uh, it's good to be prepared for the conversations ahead. Um, so this video that you should be seeing now uh, gives you sort of some sense for these structures and their um, support for marine life. This the highlights video, so I don't want to give the impression that they all look like this. Um, but in many cases, we see these structures are full of corals, mussels, fish, sponges, marine mammals, and so on. They're a bit like high-rise apartments full of marine life. And this observation has made the issue very complicated for many of us. And our next speaker, Dr. Milton Love, will offer a Californian perspective. Um, and so for those of you who are joining the symposium today and are new to the issue, just to recap on some of the options. Well, the first is we can remove these structures, tow them to shore and do our best to leave the sea floor as it was in the first place. And as Andrew indicated, there's a $50 billion plus liability for doing this, which is spread between industry and taxpayers. Another option is that we can um, leave them in the oceans and uh, leaving them either exactly where they are and they could be turned into wind farms, prisons, boarding schools, fishing clubs, you name it. Another option is that if we're concerned about them being say a navigational hazard or unsightly, you could topple them over or just take the top off. Um, or we could tow them to a new location. For example, maybe we want to position them closer to shore where they could be, say, a dive site near a popular swimming beach. Uh, thanks. Okay, I see the video playing now. Um, and so NDRI and I said we want to remain agnostic about the whole thing. Um, but we do ask one thing, which is that the, the decisions that we will make ahead about the fate of these structures is based on high quality and independent science. And to do this, 
scientists rely on industry to open the doors and also uh, open their wallets. And that's because scientists do not have the research budgets to do this sort of work. Deep ocean exploration is expensive. We also need industry to allow access to these structures for us to do our research and also access to the data repositories such as ROV footage that you've been watching so far. So it is now my pleasure to introduce to you our plenary speaker, Dr. Milton Love. This is someone who has been using ROVs to study marine life on oil and gas structures in California for over 40 years. Milton is a research biologist at the Marine Science Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He has over 100 publications, including a famous book, certainly more than you want to know about the fishes of the Pacific Ocean. And yes, that is the actual title. Milton describes it as a postmodern experience. And nothing says, I love my job more and I take my work very seriously than someone who has a tattoo of their study species. And Milton, I hope we get to see your cow cod. Uh, if, if your institution has a weak firewall, then you should be able to check out his website. It's called The Love Lab. Uh, so just Google that. And I also recommend his article, A 45 Year Career in Marine Science, Better Than a Sharp Stick in the Eye. And as one of Milton's biggest fans, um, giddy with excitement to hear him talk today, um, symposium attendees, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the person I consider to be the godfather of decommissioning science, Dr. Milton Love. So over to you, Milton, and Q Milton slides, uh, Joey and uh, Andrew. Well, <clears throat> thanks for the uh, thanks for the kind words, Peter. Um, a certain percentage of them are true, so that that was nice. And the ones that aren't true, I'm sending you a check, uh, which should arrive in the mail. That was very nice. By the way, the um, NDRI um, image of Peter that was flashed up a few minutes ago makes him look like a, a deer in the headlights. Kind of kind of an, an endearing shot, I, I must admit. So um, I'm going to summarize in the next 45 minutes or so the, uh, the research that uh, my lab has done around California oil platforms, uh, be really beginning in 1995 and to a certain extent continuing uh, to the present day. There are uh, 26 uh, oil platforms off California. And as was mentioned before, this uh, is a trivial number compared to the 4,000 approximately in the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> But um, the amount of emotion that is heaped upon the, the oil industry in California is, is uh, second to none. Uh, the, the, the background you have to understand is that after the 1969 blowout of Platform A off uh, Santa Barbara, there was a, a, a huge a firestorm of uh, anger toward the oil industry. And that has uh, really never subsided. So um, a, a lot of the research I do um, we have to understand is kind of uh, to this background of a great deal of hostility that still resides uh, to the people of Santa Barbara and the people of Southern California. So this is a typical platform. This is platform Holly, which is located right off the University of California, Santa Barbara, where, where I reside. All platforms uh, in uh, California waters are uh, steel, steel jackets, and they range in bottom depth from about 10 meters to about uh, 350 meters. They all look the same uh, underwater except for one, and we will be discussing that one at, at some length. Um, all of them except that one have cylindrical cross beams and cylindrical pilings and are actually um, not very complicated uh, underwater. And this is, we will see, uh, actually has an effect on the, the fishes that live there. I always talk about who, who's funded my work. Most of the research has come from the federal government. Apparently, un, unlike uh, you folks in Australia, federal government has been uh, quite generous in, in my case, mostly the Minerals Management Service and uh, the US Geological Survey uh, has funded the, the vast majority uh, of this research. And then there's been a small amount uh, funded by the California Artificial Reef Enhancement Program which was uh, an, an NGO that was totally funded by the oil industry, primarily by Chevron. So I did get some well-laundered money uh, from, um, from CARE. Um, 
Interestingly, uh, th there's been essentially no interest in um, any uh, uh, industry funding. Uh, the industry has, has really not been interested in funding any of my research until very recently when um, ExxonMobil funded a very specific study, which we will uh, discuss uh, anon. Um, this, is, this is the part where I talk about my role, <clears throat> which is basically, and, and this has been alluded to before as an honest uh, broker of information. So I wear two hats. There's Milton Love biologist. And in this case, I just provide facts to anybody. Uh, you can uh, hate the oil industry and hope that all the platforms are pulled out. And I give you the same facts as uh, if you um, understand that a platform is a fully functioning reef and can't understand why anybody would blow it up. You all get the same facts. So people uh, take the facts that from my surveys and studies and they can ignore them, they can twist them through their minds, they can do all those kind of things that human beings uh, always do. So that's the first hat. The second hat, however, is a Milton Love citizen, and I get to have a, a, uh, an opinion about what should happen with platforms. And my opinion is not based on science. Um, I just uh, view um, removing a platform uh, or even a part of it as immoral because uh, we, we are talking, as we will see, of uh, millions and millions and millions of organisms, not, not only fishes, but uh, many kinds of invertebrates. And um, basically, it, when you remove a part of a platform, you're killing many of these organisms. So basically, it's a capital punishment for these organisms for making a bad career choice, which is uh, just, just not a moral standpoint. But, that's, but that has nothing to do with science, and hopefully it has nothing to do with, with my conveying information, which um, uh, should be semi-Olympian anyway. So my, um, uh, our lab's uh, original um, uh, task mandate was to answer a couple questions. The first is uh, what fishes live around platforms and over nearby natural reefs off California? And the big question and the, the question that people have made their careers on is uh, whether platforms attract fish or um, create fish, produce fish, the production versus uh, attraction question. And um, that's the kind of thing that people can, this is like arguing how many angels dance on the head of a pin, basically. You can, uh, you can have people argue for their entire careers about that. And we were tasked with trying to figure that out for, for platforms. So if you actually look at, at the platforms, uh, the jackets themselves, uh, off California, and this is not true for uh, many parts of the world, but off California, the top 10 or 15 meters uh, of, the, of the seals is, uh, is covered in, in mussels and uh, mus uh, organisms that are associated uh, with mussels. So heavily coated with uh, invertebrates, again, millions and millions and millions of them. There's an example of, of what coats them. Uh, these are uh, club anemones, but you find crabs walking on them and, and sea stars uh, and the like. Lots and lots of sea anemones of various sorts. And then as you go down, depth is the great driver of uh, not just fish communities, but invertebrate communities. And so as you go deeper and deeper, the uh, assemblage of invertebrates uh, changes. And uh, this is an example in 300 feet of uh, 300 meters of water, uh, you start getting very large anemones, sponges, cold water corals, these are king crabs uh, and the like. So there are very distinct uh, invertebrate communities. And then around the platform are um, unique um, habitats that are formed by the mussels that have fallen off. And they've fallen off uh, from the shallow parts of the platform, either because of uh, gales and, and strong surges or from cleaning operations that the, um, that the industry engages in every in our area every couple of years. So basically they strip uh, down to bare steel, down to uh, 10 or 15 meters, and all of those mussels fall to the bottom. So you, you wind up with hectares of, uh, of mussels and then uh, a, a great deal of uh, organisms that associate with those mussels. And, and that kind of habitat is unique to, um, to the area around platforms, at least off California. So you get lots of sea stars, you get shrimps of various sorts and uh, a, a lot of uh, fishes that we'll uh, discuss in a moment. 
So we um, have always done two kinds of, of surveys around platforms. The top 30, 35 meters, we uh, use uh, scuba surveys. And then below that, we primarily use manned submersibles. We used ROV in a, in a couple cases, but it's been primarily uh, manned submersibles. And for most of that time, we used uh, the Delta, which is a two person uh, manned uh, uh, untethered uh, submersible. Basically, I hope this, I think this, this acts like a pointer. Um, basically the, the uh, pilot sits amidships right here and the observer kind of hunched down in the, in the bow of the vessel and looked out one particular port. Here's the port that the observer uh, looked through and uh, what the observer uh, saw were two ruby lasers. These are the ruby lasers right here. So we would see two red dots that were 20 centimeters apart. This helped train our eye because what we wanted to do was not only enumerate and identify every fish we saw, but also to estimate the length. And we actually did tests, uh, the, the whole crew, in fact, several labs did this. And it turned out we were actually pretty good at estimating uh, the, the length of, of, of fishes. And then at the same time, this uh, central cylinder uh, housed the uh, video. So this was all uh, videotaped. There was a uh, uh, microphone next to our, our mouths. So it was uh, uh, overdubbed with, with our discussions of what we saw. We would then go down uh, the platform, down the legs, and we would um, then first do a survey about uh, five meters away from the platform, we did a shell mound survey. So we looked at the fishes that lived in the shell mounds. And then we went up to the platform. There's always a cross beam at the bottom of the platform. We would look at the fishes there. And then we work our way up the platform, cross beam by cross beam by cross beam, going all the way uh, around. These are all the platforms off California. And the ones that are starred are the ones that we uh, looked at. Uh, the, Two here are in really shallow water and uh, Professor at Long Beach State surveyed the fishes there. Same thing with uh, Gina in very shallow water. And then Heritage, for some reason, ExxonMobil uh, just never allowed us to, to uh, work there. We always uh, requested permission from uh, whatever company was, was operating at a time and uh, ExxonMobil um, just would not, I don't know what they were doing there. I don't even want to think about there. They didn't want us near. So there you go. That's all I know. And we also did um, many, many dives on natural reefs because you need a frame of reference. So it's not good enough to say, well, here are the densities of uh, fishes around platforms. If you don't know what the nearby or even far away natural reef uh, densities of fishes were, you don't have a frame of reference. And uh, over, um, over time, this is a, a little uh, short of the mark. We, we actually stopped most of our submersible surveys in, in 11, but we covered uh, a, a vast uh, swath of Southern California. Every one of those was a, a dive we made. And, and out here, this is as far out as you can go before you drop off um, the continental shelf. And that's the uh, take home message as far as fishes are concerned. Not all platforms uh, are created equal, in fact, Every platform to a certain extent uh, is unique, but if, if you held a gun to my head and said, well, you, you've got to generalize, uh, this is what we'd come up with. First of all, in, in the shallower waters, and again, this is not uh, the same uh, as in tropical waters in the Gulf of Mexico or Africa or, or Australia, um, there was a suite of uh, small pelagic fishes that would come through, uh, mackerels and sardines and the like. The, the platform was uh, of no benefit or, or, uh, or downside to them. They were just passing through. And then there was a, a suite of shallow water reef associated fishes. These are uh, a damselfish, the Garibaldi, and uh, uh, a wrasse, the, the sheephead. So very standard uh, fishes, the same ones you see on, uh, on natural reefs in, in the same depths. But the big difference, and the one we will come back to over and over and over again, and something that may, for all we know, be unique to California platforms, is the, uh, in some years, uh, very high densities of young rockfishes. Rockfishes, uh, as a group, uh, dominate uh, virtually all of the uh, habitats on the uh, west coast of the United States. There are uh, 
over 100 species of, of rockfishes, maybe 50 in California. And uh, there's a suite of, of those species that um, recruit as, as juveniles to, um, to platforms. And as we will discuss um, in, in a bit, they, they actually recruit in higher numbers to platforms than to most uh, natural reefs. So there, there's a good example. In some years, you see hundreds of thousands of these young fish, and they'll only stay there for um, perhaps a year, and then they leave. So that's the midwater. So the midwater communities are actually different than the bottom and shell mound communities. Uh, the bottom and shell mound communities um, are associated, the, the species. So you tend to see uh, larger fishes. These are vermilion rockfish. These are boccaccio. We're going to talk about boccaccio because it, it's an officially overfished species. Just got out of overfish status, according to the federal government, a year or two ago. But at one time, it was down to about 7% of its unfished level. And That's not working. And there's the other um, kind of poster child for being overfished. This is the cow rockfish. I actually have a tattoo, as Peter alluded to, a, cow, a tattoo of a cow rockfish that if you're good and you haven't fallen asleep, I will show you at the uh, end of this presentation. And, and, and again, um, uh, very typical of the bottom of these platforms. Note, and th this will come up, so this is the bottom cross beam and all the platforms are designed to have a cross beam right by the seafloor. In some cases, the cross beam is undercut and in other cases, it's been sanded over. Where it is undercut, it forms uh, what to a fish, I think they perceive it's a cave. So that's where you tend to see fishes at the bottom. You tend to see these reef fishes in, on, uh, in these long crevices. And then on the, on the shell mounds, even though there's a similarity between the shell mound community and the, ba and the base, you tend to find large numbers, uh, very large uh, densities of small fish, either young fish or fishes that do not get large. These are half banded rock fishes. A half banded on steroids isn't gonna get much more than, than 20 centimeters long. So you tend to find very high densities of, of small fish on the, on the shells. There's a juvenile cow cod maybe uh, five centimeters long, they'll be found on the shells. And as they get bigger, they tend to associate with the bottom of the platform. <clears throat> this is a, um, an image that kind of summarizes all of the, of the fish communities we saw. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, NMDS plots, every one of these symbols is uh, an assemblage of fishes we saw in a particular year. So uh, the different um, symbols represent different parts of the platform. So these uh, triangles, these are the midwaters, the inverted triangles or the normal triangles or the base and so forth. And, and the message here, if you look at the colors is that fishes tend to, tend to be similar depending on depth. That's the first thing and that's, that's not a big surprise. Depth is the greatest driver of fish communities off California. The other thing to notice is that these midwater symbols, these inverted triangles, tend to be separated um, from all the other symbols. And that means that the platform midwater assemblage of fishes are different than all of the, the other ones. The other thing that's really important is that the natural reef dots they tend again to kind of cluster with each other, but not with the other symbols. So it turns out that the fish communities at platforms off California are somewhat different than the fish communities at nearby natural reefs. So this is a, a study uh, that we, uh, that, that I, I kind of was interested in. I mentioned that most platforms, uh, the jacket looks like this the cylindrical cross beams, cylindrical uh, pilings. There's one platform, however, that looks totally different. And so platform Gale is a typical one. Platform Eureka is the atypical one. If you look downwards, we're now at the surface and we're looking down, very typical platform. Platform Eureka was built with these flanges. These are uh, 
skirt pilings. So basically when they were installed, there were piling wooden pilings that went right through these openings here and stabilize the platform. Well, what that does, it, it creates just a lot of complexity. And I was interested to look at the role that complexity plays in what fishes live at, at a platform, because in most of the cases, the platforms are not complex. But here we have an example of one, a unique one that is complex. The question is, are there different fishes or fishes in different amounts in those, on those two platforms? The nice thing is that the platforms are in similar depths in the same water masses, and we survey them a, a day or two apart. So almost everything was held constant. And again, this is an M MNDS plot. The key thing is the dots are uh, platform gale. And again, these represent communities of fishes and the uh, triangles represent Eureka. And you can see the fish communities are different. And the only thing different about these two communities, one has more complexity to its jacket than the other. So where are the differences? Okay, so the top figure is Eureka, complex. The bottom is Gale, not complex. Density, these are dense, total densities of fishes. Higher as you go to the right, and you can see that in general, higher densities of fishes at the more complex platform. This is the number of species, more species uh, with depth at the more complex platform. This is size, more larger fish at Eureka. So what's going on? Well, it turns out that that function I told you about before, where you have an, a, a separate assemblage of midwater fishes at a typical platform from the bottom does not hold up at Eureka. And the reason it doesn't hold up is you have all of this complexity so that bottom fishes think they're on the bottom, even if they're way up in the midwater. And so you get this suite of midwater fishes living in an atypical place uh, because of that complexity. We also did a recent study looking at the conductors. So conductors are those vertical pipes uh, through which the gas or oil flows. And we had never really looked at them before as fish habitat. There, uh, there can be 30, 40, 50 of them, and they can occupy a lot of, of space inside the jacket. And the question was, well, how good fish habitat were they uh, or are they compared to the cross beams, which is what we always uh, looked at. So we looked at two platforms, Holly and A. They're built about the same. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. This was a scuba survey. So we did platform A in one year and we did Holly. And basically we, we surveyed the fishes that lived on the cross beams, the fishes that lived in the, uh, among the conductors, and then the fishes that lived in the open water still underneath the platform, but not associated or closely associated with habitat. And <clears throat> what we found is that so the blue dots are the fishes that live in open water. And basically they are different than the orange and red dots. The orange and red dots are the fishes that live on the conductors and the fishes that live on the cross beams. Those fish communities were similar. The open water ones were different. And in fact, um, if, if you look at the densities of fish, so these are the densities go up. So the higher the, the uh, square is, the higher the densities. These are the two platforms. And you can see that the densities of uh, cross beam fish community and the densities of the um, conductor community uh, fish densities are about, uh, they're statistically the same. However, very, very few fish are living in the open water. So the message there that <laughs> no one is ever gonna follow is that uh, the, the typical thing during decommissioning, at least in the United States, is no matter what you do with the platform, tip it over, tow it away, you always remove the conductors. But what this says is, at least for those two platforms, what you're doing is removing fish habitat. And it's habitat that is just as good, at least in terms of density, as the cross beams. So if you really were concerned about retaining habitat, Absolutely, you re re retain the conductors. 
at least off California. I mean, I can't speak for any place else. <clears throat> we made some comparisons between fishes that live on platforms and fishes that live on reefs. And that's a whole hour long uh, talk I could give. But what I wanted to, to emphasize was the nursery function that platforms have. And what I want to show you is a, a, a series of surveys we did over a number of years between this platform, Platform Hidalgo, and this reef, North Reef. Um, platform Hidalgo and North Reef sit in about 150 meters of water, clearly in the same water mass. We did the submersible surveys uh, on the same day, so there wasn't a seasonal effect. And we looked at the fish communities. Um, North, North Reef is a typical reef. I mean, it's like five meters tall. And of course, the, the platform covers the entire water column. And this is what we found. The first thing to note, so that's a um, uh, year along the, uh, the x-axis. And um, the higher the bars are, the higher the densities. And we only looked at rock, uh, yoy rock fishes. So yoy means young of the year. Think of them as baby rock fishes, all the species combined. So the first thing you see, and blue is the platform, and North Reef is in red, is that every single year, the blue bar is higher than the red bar. So the densities of uh, young rock fishes every single year was higher at the platform, sometimes much, much higher, but also that it varied from year to year. And this makes sense at both the platform and North Reef. And this makes sense because what you're looking at is survivorship of very young fishes. These fishes have been drifting, being carried around in, in the plankton for two, three, four months. And a lot of bad things can happen to young fishes. And in some years, uh, bad things happen to essentially all of them. And in other years, bad things happen to a fewer number of them. So there's variability. So when I say, and in this case, it, it's correct, that uh, Platform Adalgo is a better nursery ground than the nearby reef. Um, that's not true every, it's not like every single year there's incredibly high densities of these young fishes. Uh, it, it just, by comparison, it's a better nursery ground. And this is what you see on a very quote unquote good year when there was very good survivorship of young fishes. There are so many of these young fishes that you can't see the platform. The platform is only about three meters away, but you can't see the platform for all of these fish. So now I'd like to hone in on this fish. So this is uh, Boccaccio, formerly overfished, vastly overfished. And this is one of those species that you find in very high densities in some years. That's a key thing, in some years. So this is an example. So in 2003, I only had money to take the submarine to a, a few platforms but we found really high densities of these fishes. And um, I was, I started, we always used to use just density, number of fish per square meter. But I started thinking, well, how many fish are we really talking about? So we made estimates and it was about 400,000 of these young Boccaccio for these few platforms. So that sounded like a lot to me, but what did I know? So I went to the National Marine Fisheries Service to a guy named Alec McCall who was the stock assessment person for Boccaccio, he had a, a software and I said, well, is 400,000 Boccaccio, is that important? And he said, well, so the abundance of, of these yois in on six platforms, that was about 20% of the average of all the juveniles, all the young of the year for the entire range of the animal. So that's fairly important. But the really important question was how many adults Will these turn into because there's going to be mortality? Well, he's got another program. And he said, those fish from one year six platforms, they contributed about 1% of the amount of Boccaccio needed to rebuild their stock. Now, is this true in every year? No. Is it true for every platform? No. Is it true uh, for every fish, species of fish? No. This is what I got. But for that fish in that year, the platforms were really important. And, and that's a key thing. You can't generalize beyond what I've, I've given you here. 
but you can see the, the, the potential and that's, that's the important thing. So um, here I am and um, I'm giving this same talk to a bunch of uh, executives from the oil industry. I think, I think that's the CEO of Exxon Mobil, could be the CEO from Chevron, I'm not sure. I can't remember, it was a long time ago. And you know, clearly the industry is interested here I am, on the other hand, talking to uh, members of, uh, of the environmental community. Not so much. I've, I've never uh, gotten a lot of, uh, of love from the environmental community. And that's because many of the environmental community, they don't like oil platforms and they don't really like what I have to say, which is ironic because, again, to be transparent, I, I, I like walk on the far left side of the political street and over there with the uh, heavy environmentalists, but uh, not so much. So uh, when I first started presenting this data, these, this early data, a whole series of objections, I shouldn't say that, a whole series of points were brought up and I had to start addressing more nuanced points. And I'll go through some of those now. So talking about little Boccaccio, in 2003, maybe there were little Boccaccio everywhere on, on natural reefs too. Maybe that year, the year that I presented to you, was just a fabulous year for these fish. So that was a good point. And fortunately, there are a lot of scuba surveys done on Boccaccio habitat. And I had a lot of friends who did those surveys. And this is what we came up with. These, are, these numbers are densities. So these are the platforms here. You can see the numbers are 368. Grace was like insane, but you know, 19, 18. These are number of Boccaccio per 100 meters squared, pretty high. But if you look at the natural reefs, lots of zeros. And even when it's not zero, one, 1.9, 1.7, down here, zeros, it was not a great year. 2003, high densities at platforms, but not at natural reefs. Is this true every year? I don't know, we only did it for one year. I'm not gonna be able to generalize. But in that year, it looked like the action, the heavy recruitment of these young fishes was at the platforms. You fool, maybe they all die. Well, that's an interesting point. So that came about because uh, back around 1998, 1999, I was talking to my friend, Mark Carr, who's a, a professor at the University of California. He was a grad student then. I said, you know, I think I saw 400,000 young widow rockfish at Platform Hidalgo. I think the platform is producing fish, not attracting them, producing them. And he looked at me and he said, how do you know the next day they didn't all die? And I thought, well, I actually said, screw you, Mark, and th because that's what a good scientist would say. And uh, you, you'd have to be God to know the fate of every one of those 400,000 fish, but it turns out that nature has given us um, kind of a natural experiment. This is a fairly complicated figure, but I'll walk you through it. This is one platform, platform Gale. These are only Boccaccio. These are different years where we went out with our little submarine and we identified and counted and measured all the fish that we saw from the surface to the bottom. And the higher the bar, the higher the density, okay? I have no idea if you're with me or you're just frowning, but let's assume you're with me. So basically follow this line, okay? So in 1999, pretty good densities up near the surface of little Boccaccio. There's the size classes down at the bottom. Next year, oh, pretty high densities of Boccaccio that were slightly larger. Following year, oh, look, hmm, another uh, pretty good densities of Boccaccio that are slightly larger. And you can follow, probably, you can follow this year class all the way to 2003, 2004, where they stop growing. Now, by the way, it's possible that the fish here are different than the fish here, different, but you know what? That's uh, highly unlikely. It's highly unlikely that, that the fish here died and were replaced by fish that were larger uh, it's the most likely thing is these fish are growing and they're growing and they're growing, getting bigger. And then they stopped. Well, what happened there? Why did they stop? Well, what happens is right around this age, around six years, this species matures. When fishes mature, their growth rate slows. 
because they're putting energy into sperm and eggs. And that's probably what happened here. Not only did these fish survive, they survived to become adults. So at least for Boccaccio at this platform, they didn't all die. Maybe they're all stunted. This is an interesting point. You got 400,000 fish and uh, babies. They're eating plankton. They're not eating uh, the stuff on the, on the platform. So maybe there's just a finite, well, there is, there's a finite number of plankton that are coming through. Maybe there are so many young ones that their growth rates are stunted, in which case the platform might be a bad thing for these young fish. So what we did was we collected th this species, blue rockfish, and we collected them on platforms and nearby natural reefs. Here's two platforms and two natural reefs that were nearby. And we actually removed their ear bones and we, and fish lay down uh, rings. They actually lay down rings every single day. So you can take a fish and you can count how many days old it was and you can look at its length. And if you have enough fish where you know their length and how many days old they were, you can actually get a growth rate. So the higher the bar, the faster the growth rate, blue as is our want were the platforms, red is the natural reef. And it turned out for this year, for these two platforms and natural reefs, for this species, the, the fish at the, the platforms were actually growing statistically faster than the ones at, at the platform or at the reefs. Now, not much faster, and I don't think biologically it's that important, but what we can say is the fish were not stunted. Now, if we went out and did the same study the next year, would the fish be stunted at the platforms? I don't know, I didn't have any money. I would go out tomorrow and do it again if I could, but this is what I got. Maybe if the platform were not there, all the Yoi Boccaccio would recruit to natural reefs. This is a really good point. So you got all these little Boccaccio or any species, whatever you want, and they're drifting around the plankton and the current takes them next or through the platform. They're ready to um, settle out and they don't care what they're, they're settling out on. It can be steel, it can be a rock, it could be a rubber tire. They don't care. And so they settle out because they are physiologically ready. So the question is, if the platform wasn't there, if you could remove that platform and the fish sailed by that area, would they find a natural reef? In which, and if that's true, um, then, the, 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 then the platform doesn't serve any, any useful function as a nursery ground because the, the fish would have found uh, a, a natural reef. <clears throat> so fortunately for us, we have, the university has uh, CODAR stations uh, set up along the coast. So CODAR is a radar that instead of being focused into the air is focused on the sea and it looks at current patterns. So you can, uh, in, in a computer model, once you know where the computer, uh, where the currents are, you can put pretend whatever, drifters, Boccaccio, doesn't matter, pieces of kelp, and you can uh, model where they go. So there's, there's some examples. So, you know, you, you put a, a, a Boccaccio here, and you go like that, and look, basically you're looking at the ones that hit the platform. Then what you do is you remove that platform. And you can do that a bazillion times. You remove that platform and ask the question, where do they go from there? And the rules we set up were, if they got into near shore water, that's where the nursery ground is, they survived. If they got carried offshore, digitally, then they died, which would have been true. And it turned out when we did this for three years, we only used the time of year when these babies would be drifting around. About 75% on average would have been carried offshore. They would have not made it to the near shore uh, area. Now, is that true for every platform? We don't know. Is it true <laughs> for every fish? We don't know, but this is what we got. and and. It's strong evidence that at least some of the platforms really are a lifeline for some of these young fishes. Maybe when the young Boccaccio leave a platform, they all die a terrible, terrible death. So um, the, the life history of this species is that they recruit to shallow water and within a year or two, they start swimming deeper and deeper and deeper. 
So they may recruit to 15, 20 meters of water, but by, that, by the time they're an adult, they're in 100 meters of water. So over time, over five, six years, they get deeper and deeper. At a platform, if the platform is too shallow, if the bottom of the platform is too shallow, the, the fish, they go down, they go like, oh, this sucks, and they leave. And the question is, if you had, and this happens, 100,000 little boccaccio at a platform that's shallow, and they all swim away, maybe they die, right? Well, fortunately for me, the California Department of Fish and Game tagged a bunch of baby boccaccio back in, in the late 70s, early 80s. Here's the platforms of Santa Barbara, and they got returns. They got adults with tags sticking in them all over the place, all up and down the channel. These are all going to natural reefs. So what we can say is at least some of the fish that leave, some of these young rock fishes of various sorts, they survive. And so the platform, which arguably is producing fish, those produced fish leave and seed natural reefs. Is that true again for every platform? Maybe, maybe not, who knows, but it is true for some. Maybe they all glow in the dark. Okay, so this comes up uh, routinely. Platforms are not places where they're making cotton candy, right? Platforms are industrial enterprises. And uh, when they drill, there's drill muds. Drill muds used to contain a lot of heavy metals. Now they don't contain as many heavy metals. There is produced water, uh, all kinds of stuff that you could uh, hypothesize could get into the fish. You, and and th that question arises all the time. Um, we got funding from the from the federal government to look at this question. Basically, we uh, took five um, platforms and we collected fish, same species, uh, a, a fish that lives in the midwater and a fish that lives on the bottom at the platform. And then we collected the same species in what we believe to be control areas in various places. And then we sent all the fish to a, a lab in Missouri, a federal lab, and they did a whole suite, I don't know, 40 or 50, uh, uh, a panel of 40 or 50 uh, heavy metals, different elements, things that you would expect would pollute the animals, uh, mercury, uh, selenium, cadmium, all kinds of things. And the bottom line is we saw nothing. We saw no difference between fishes in the control area and fishes at the platform. <clears throat> so the last study that I wanna talk about it's one we just finished, and it was the one that was um, uh, paid for by ExxonMobil. And basically, ExxonMobil came to us and said, um, can we use, and this has some bearing perhaps for you folks. They said, can we use our um, structural ROV surveys for biological purposes? And um, uh, which is a fabulous question. So we set up an experiment and basically they had a, a structural uh, ROV that was looking at the integrity of a platform uh, north of us. And they gave us a couple days and um, we had the pilot who is, he normally does these surveys. We had him do two kinds of surveys. One was what we called the structural survey. And then we just said, <clears throat> we want you to go along the cross beams in the midwater and we want you to go along the cross beam at the bottom and just pretend that you're doing your usual survey. And we found that he kind of did them at about a 45 degree angle, got pretty close to the, plat to the cross beams. And that was the, the structural test. Then we said, well, now we want you to do a biological test that kind of mimics what we do in our, in our submersibles or what, which we do in our ROVs. And that is, we want the camera to look straight at the at the, at the, um, the crossbeam. And uh, we want it to be two meters away because that's what we've always done. And when you do the bottom um, crossbeam, we want you to be uh, just a foot or so above the seafloor so that we're looking laterally underneath the, the crossbeam. So they did that. <clears throat> okay, and so what they found, first of all, this, these blue and green dots those are the fish communities that were seen in the midwaters uh, using the two techniques. 
So the blue is the, um, the essentially mimicking the industry surveys and the green was our surveys, biological surveys, and there was really no difference in what was seen and the densities what was seen. However, at the bottom, there was a difference. Two different communities were uh, observed. The red ones uh, are the um, structural surveys, and then the other ones uh, are the surveys our way. So they actually saw, in general, different species of fishes. Not only that, but they saw different densities. So if you look, and again, the higher the, the square, the higher the density, midwater is here, two different ways of surveying, statistically the same. Not only did they see the same fish, they saw them in the same densities. On the other hand, at the base, the, the structural surveys saw fewer uh, fishes and different fishes than the ones uh, done using our biological technique. So well, why is that? So this, this actually tells you the reason. So these are frame grabs from the two types of surveys. This is the exact same place. See that, that little liney stuff? That's the same one. The top is what the biological survey sees. The bottom is what the imitation structural survey sees. With our technique, because we specifically said, we want you right on the bottom and we want you looking laterally, you can see underneath this undercut beam. It's under cross beam. You can't see that with the uh, pseudo, not pseudo, but but um, imitation um, structural survey. So all of the fishes, and there are a lot of them, that live in this crevice are lost using that technique. I have no idea if this holds up in other places. I have no idea if it holds up <laughs> beyond the survey that we did, but it was intriguing uh, that th there may be something uh, going on there. It does imply that the midwaters, it hardly matters how you survey. <clears throat> the last thing, um, was probably the most dramatic um, of all the analyses done with our data. This was done by Jeremy Clace, my associate, um, and, and he was interested in fish production. And uh, basically fish production in this case is, is a metric, it's a combination of the density of fishes at a site, doesn't matter what the site is, and how fast they're growing, how fast they're packing on carbon. And, it, and fish production is used all over the world to, to measure um, kind of the health uh, of uh, different habitats, estuaries, coral reefs. And what he found was um, every single platform of California that he looked at uh, had higher fish production than in the recorded literature on any other marine or estuarian site in the world. Even the least productive of uh, the platforms. Well, why is that? Is that like the industry has uh, sprinkled pixie dust on, on these magical places. Uh, no, and, and in fact, it may not even hold up in other places. Um, it, this is purely a, um, a, uh, an example of, of the life history of, of this very speciose group of fishes, the rock fishes. And that is, you get these incredibly high densities of young fishes around platforms, and you don't see that and natural reefs. So you have not only high densities of the fish, but they're young. So they are growing, they are like doubling in size really fast. When you combine that, you get these astronomically high uh, examples of fish production. So um, some of the summaries that we can take from this. So in, in the broadest terms, there are uh, two fish assemblages around most uh, platforms. One is in the midwaters and one is in the um, uh, the base and the shell mounds. The water columns within many platforms serve as rockfish nursery grounds. Not all of them, by the way. The inshore platforms, the ones that are in very shallow water, not so much. Uh, young of the year densities around many platforms are greater than those uh, on most natural reefs. Um, I didn't mention this, there's a de facto uh, marine preserve uh, effect on most of our platforms. The industry does not like unknown little boats coming up 
and, and phishing, particularly after 9-11, they have no idea who you are if you want to blow them up. So they'll call the Coast Guard and they'll shout at you and they'll turn their fire hoses on you. So there's actually relatively little phishing that goes on around most platforms. And so there's a de facto Marine Reserve function, de facto because these weren't set up as Marine Reserves, right? They were set up to pump hydrocarbon, but they're acting as reserves. So you tend to find bigger fish and more and higher densities of bigger fish around many platforms than on natural reefs where you're allowed to fish. And as with natural reefs, platforms both produce and aggregate fish. And, and this is crucial. If someone came up to me and said, the most important fish in my life is the kelp bass. Are platforms producing kelp bass? I'd go like, nope, they're not producing kelp bass because we never see little baby ones. And only one platform has an aggr a spawning aggregation of them. Uh, other than that, they're just not very important. Uh, if, if on the other hand, you go like, well, it looks like You've got all these other rockfish species where you get hundreds of thousands of young. Uh, are, are, are the platforms producing those fish? I'll go like, yeah, in some years, they certainly are. And um, the other thing is that on average, fishes around platforms are neither more uh, or less uh, polluted, at least with a suite of, um, uh, of elements that we looked at. We didn't really look at uh, PAHs or other uh, degradation byproducts of of hydrocarbons, so I, I can't answer that. And California oil and gas platforms are among the most productive uh, habitats, uh, certainly in the ocean or in uh, estuarine waters. Um, so is there still time for me to show off my tattoos? Yes, it's a must. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> so. These are, I mean, first of all, compared to some Yakuza gangster in Tokyo, these are not special, right? They're special to me because I endured, you know, the burning sensation. And I also got them before everybody and their dog got them. I got them and, I, and when I got them, my kids, I told my kids I was gonna get them. And uh, my daughter, this is the difference between my kids. Uh, my daughter, who was like 13 at the time, said, well, you're gonna want a million of them. I went, oh, okay. And uh, my son said, well, where are you gonna get them? And, or one. And I said, uh, I don't know, my arm maybe? He said, well, if you don't like it, you can always gnaw it off. So very different personalities my, my kids have. So I got two, one, uh, one time, one the other. So this one, the top one, so by the way, these cost 60 bucks, not bad. And I keep telling Peter, if he gets a tattoo, I'll pay the first $60 of it. <laughs> that's all I'm going though, Peter. And that's Australian, not, not real money either. So um, this is a cow cod right there. It's kind of me, my totemic uh, animal. This one, many of you will recognize, it's a deep water angler fish. And uh, what I like about them, this is the female. The male is right there. And basically the life history is they start out life as separate fish then the male tracks down, probably the female lays a pheromone trail down as she matures. And the male comes up and bites her in this one species, bites her by her vent and never lets go. And, and, and in fact, the, the male eventually turns into not much more than a sack of sperm. So the, the male is essentially a, um, a sexual parasite of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the female, which has been my goal in life forever. And I, I keep mentioning that to Jane, my wife, and, and by this time, I, I don't even get a response anymore. It's like, I've been married too long, is what it comes down to. But anyway, those are my, my tattoos. Peter, If uh, just let me know. Send me a picture, and I'll send you the check, man. I, I text messaged Andrew last night and said, we've got to organize a gift for Milton. We forgot to do that. And he said, what about a subscription to Nira? But I was suggesting maybe another tattoo. So, um... Oh, Jane will kill me. <laughs> Jane would kill me. Maybe one of Jane could be the next one. <laughs> um, look, thank you for that, Milton. That was a masterclass in science communication. And I want to thank you for bringing uh, levity to the issue. I think it's much needed for us in Australia at the moment as we feel this sleeping giant is sort of starting to wake up. And I do indeed feel like a deer in the headlights at the moment. <laughs>
Um, with the buildup of mussels on the seafloor and how that creates unique habitat for fish and invertebrates was fascinating. You really get a sense for how these structures start to become living. And I think it was also very clear uh, that our understanding of the habitat value of these structures, including all these nuances around variation in depth, habitat complexity, all this stuff can only come from investing the time and the resources into scientific surveys to actually look for this. Um, I think your data made a really uh, compelling case that um, you can perhaps design structures to maximize habitat value. And, well, yeah. you know, we should consider this at the outset. Maybe we can pick up on this in the next panel to session around designing for purpose. So, um, look, I know we're almost at time here for the break. So I, I just wanted to say thank you. You've left a great legacy of research for California and given us much to think about. Let's pick up on questions for you in the next panel session. Um, we really appreciate you sticking around on what is a Californian evening at your end. Sure. Um, so we're gonna take a 15 minute break, which means that if you're on the West Coast of Australia, we're gonna come back at 10.40. And if you're on the East Coast where I am, that's 12.40. So now's your chance to make a coffee, do some star jumps. And if you have any questions, make sure you put them in the chat box. And Milton said to me, no boring questions. I'm too old and too tired. And also maybe just coming back to the disclaimer that Andrew put, just remember that there are kind of two sides to the panel members, you know, they're all scientists. So on the one hand, you're getting what Milton described as the honest broker of information. You get the facts, which is really important in a post-truth world where, you know, objective facts are becoming less influential than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Um, and then the other side, you've got the citizen. So uh, you got to figure out who we're talking to there. So I'll see you in 15 minutes. We're right on schedule. Um, see you soon.